Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the London School of Economics. Uh, my name is Martin Husovec, and this is my colleague Luke McDonough. We're both uh, from the LSE Law School, and I will be your today's host. Um, so the lecture today will uh, take approximately 90 minutes. Uh, we'll have a lecture, um, commentary, and then Q&A uh, with you. And after this lecture, we'll invite you to join us for the wine reception outside this room. Um, so you're all invited to join us. Uh, the lecture today is being recorded uh, and will be published online, which means that um, whatever you ask today will be remembered because it will be online. So keep that in mind when you pose your questions. Okay, today's inaugural uh, Bill Cornish Memorial Lecture is a very special lecture. Um, the event is a tribute to a man who devoted his life to study of legal institutions that protect authors and inventors. Um, Professor Bill Cornish spent nearly three decades at LSE, another two decades at Cambridge, University of Cambridge, tirelessly, tirelessly researching um, how to facilitate that creators appropriately benefit from their scientific and artistic production. As, you, as we all know, he was a leading figure in the European Intellectual Property Scholarship and always kept an eye on the big picture. So we have decided um, that we will hold these annual memorial lectures in his name, with the permission of, um, of uh, Mr. Lovely Cornish, to keep his intellectual legacy alive at LSE and to make sure that we don't forget to ask the most important questions in our domain, which are, do creators adequately benefit? And if not, how to improve their situation? So we are extremely grateful today um, for our inaugural speaker who uh, will be shortly introduced by my colleague. Um, but before I give him the floor, I would like to mention that the University of Cambridge has set up a special fund, the Bill Cornish Memorial Fund, which will offer uh, financial support to students who want to research intellectual property law. Therefore, um, if you want to advance um, the legacy of Professor Bill Cornish, you now have at least two ways. First, you can keep coming to this annual lecture series engage with us. And second, if you can, we invite you to contribute to the Cambridge Bill Cornish Memorial Fund. And if you cannot, at least spread the word. And with that, I uh, give the word to Luke. Thank you, Martin. Thank you all for coming. It's really wonderful to see so many familiar faces. Um, you know, we've got a lot of members of the IP community here from London, from, you know, Queen Mary's well-represented King's College is here, um, members of the judiciary, barristers, it's really wonderful to see you all. Um, I just want to spend a few moments talking about our esteemed speaker, Professor Jane Ginsberg, who is the Morton Janklow Professor of Literary and Artistic Property Law at Columbia Law School, and has certainly had a big influence on my copyright law scholarship particularly the aspects of international law that I think Jane probably knows better than anyone else in the world. You know, when we think about the Berne Convention, Jane's book with, with Sam Rickardson is, is the, uh, the paradigm. Um, on a more personal note, what links Jane and Bill in my mind is that I met them on the same day in 2009 at the Alai conference, which was celebrating 300 years since the Statute of Anne. And it was really a wonderful moment to meet such big figures. You know, when you're a PhD student and you meet the big names in your field, they're not always nice to you. But I'm very happy to say <laughs> that Jane was incredibly nice and uh, actually showed an interest in what I was doing. The same, of course, was true of Bill. I mean, uh, Everybody knows what a nice man he was and generous. And I'm, I'm very happy that my experience with them both was so positive at that same time. Of course, Lionel is, is uh, uh, well known for, for also being very dedicated and, and kind to young copyright law scholars. So part of what we're trying to do is to, to use the space that we have here at LSC. For some of you, this might be the first time you've come into this building. It's quite new to us. Um, to really, you know, both honor the legacy of IP at LSE that Bill Cornish started, but also to look to the future. And 
Having had the privilege to read Jane's lecture in advance, I can assure you you're in for um, a very interesting and thoughtful um, uh, <coughs> script that I think will point towards several different directions, but also look back at parts of copyright history, and particularly what, what Bill has, uh, has worked on in the past. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over to, uh, to Jane, and uh, please come up and take the mic or as, as you wish. Thank you very much, Luke and Martin, for uh, inviting me to give this inaugural lecture. It's a tremendous honor, uh, and it's also a bit emotional to uh, be, uh, be the first of what I'm sure will be uh, a long series of distinguished lectures, uh, all of them uh, duly honoring the memory of an outstanding scholar, uh, a great mentor, uh, and as some of you know, uh, a great duet partner of my husband. Uh, they're both uh, pianists uh, occasionally seen in public uh, at uh, LIE congresses uh, around the world. So, uh, as, uh, as was mentioned, uh, this, uh, the impetus for this lecture was uh, a talk uh, that Bill Cornish gave in uh, 2002 uh, at Columbia Law School, the uh, annual Horace S. Manges Lecture. The talk was titled, The Author as Risk Sharer. And the lecture examined the perennial problem of authors' remuneration. Authors' contracts tend to result in revenues disproportionately low relative to the returns to investors and intermediaries. Professor Cornish compared the laissez-faire or risk-sharing approach of Anglo-American law to the more author protective constraints on copyright contracts prevalent in continental jurisdictions. Presently, albeit not anticipating Brexit, Professor Cornish forecast, and I quote, within a short period, the Franco-German axis in the EU could be committed to limiting what an author can submit to by contract. The British will find themselves drawn, more or less willingly, into abandoning their old hands-off policy toward authors and performers' contracts. An EU directive might require the setting of common remuneration standards and indeed numerous other conditions in order to ensure that a level playing field for authors is maintained across the whole common market. The adoption in 2019 of an EU directive declaring authors and performers, quote, entitlement to receive appropriate and proportionate remuneration, end quote, bore out Professor Cornish's prediction, albeit not for the UK. Moreover, notwithstanding the Anglo-American tradition, Professor Cornish ultimately endorsed the author interventionist approach. He inquired, so how should common law systems view these authors' rights laws on guarantees of remuneration? I believe that they are fundamentally worthwhile, though of course with a decent common lawyer's circumspection, as he would say. They are a form of legal constraint which, based on more than concerns over work for hire or intellectual creativity or sacrosanct moral rights, seek to preserve real benefits from copyright laws for the authors in whose name the copyrights are granted. They seek to ensure that copyright laws are not, are not mere pretexts for protecting the investment and entrepreneurial initiative of authors exploiting partners. Why, after all, do we continue to have copyright laws which derive their legal and moral force 
from the act of creativity. The last observation seems to me key. A system built solely on investor incentives should differ substantially from the modern copyright regime as those who think about what, if any, kind of protection should attach to the authorless outputs of artificial intelligence systems would recognize. The moral high ground of copyright requires the preservation or institution of measures to ensure real benefits from copyright laws for the authors in whose name the copyrights are granted. I will consider the various techniques, national and for the EU regional copyright laws, have, in, have employed to provide those real benefits to authors. These include targeting the term, terms of the grant of rights, for example, by denominating some rights inalienable, by regulating the scope or duration of a grant, by returning rights to authors if their grantees fail to exploit the work, or by providing for the adjustment of the author's compensation if their shares become disproportionately low relative to their grantees' returns. The 2019 European Union Digital Single Market Directive employs most of these techniques. In Britain, historically, and still in the US, authors' reversion or termination rights attempt to redress the balance between authors and exploiters of the works by giving authors a second bite of the apple at licensing their rights. None of these techniques, however, guarantee that authors will in fact receive the appropriate and proportionate remuneration to which legal systems, particularly in the EU, might or should aspire. Impediments include, first, a cultural predilection, especially in common law countries, for free alienability of property rights, together with ambivalent attitudes about the merits of author protections. Second, the potential for circumvention of substantive author protections by manipulation of private international law rules particularly as to forum selection and choice of law. And third, and perhaps most intractably, the rise of online platform terms of service requiring creators to surrender effectively all of their rights when posting their works to the platform. So let's start with free alienability. It's no accident that the copyright law of the US and other common law countries favors easy alienability of authors' rights. Our legal system frowns on restraints on alienation. Perhaps ironically, the ability freely to part with property is a hallmark of, his own, of its ownership. So freedom of contract provides the prevailing norm that the authors freedom to contract away all her rights works to the benefit of the so-called content industries could traditionally be justified as consistent with the overall goals of the copyright scheme. These are not only to promote the care and feeding of authors, but also, some would contend primarily, to ensure the dissemination of works of authorship. After all, the US constitutional goal to promote the progress of science is not met merely by creating works. Someone has to get them from the author's pen or laptop into the public's hands or screens. To the extent that authors retard that progress by endeavoring to withhold some rights or make it more expensive by demanding more pay for rights granted, authors can seem like pesky interlopers. Australian writer Miles Franklin, best known for her novel My Brilliant Career, captured this annoyance in Bring the Monkey, her 1933 parody of the English country house murder mystery. 
the conversation she imagined among members of Britain's budding motion picture industry anticipates what US film and TV studios may be fantasizing today, now that the members of the Writers Guild of Motion Picture and Television Screenwriters have gone on strike for a decent share of the income, especially from streaming services and new media platforms on the internet. Miles Franklin wrote, the film magnets were generally agreed that the total elimination of the author would be a tremendous advance. Authors, said that this gentleman, are the bummest lot of cranks I have ever been up against. Why the heck they aren't content to beat it once they get a price for their stuff gets my goat. There was ready agreement that authors were a wanton tax on any industry whether publishing, drama, or pictures. I understand your point of view, the film producer said suavely. That is why I want you to see my film. It has been assembled by experts in the industry, not written by some wayward outsider. And indeed, in the film, there was no suggestion of an author. Instead, the suave producer was listed twice as continuity expert and producer. Miles Franklin was certainly on to something as we learned that today's screenwriters fear that suave producers will replace them with chat GPT. Consistent with the desire to get authors out of the way of the work's exploitation, the U.S. copyright law contains few mandatory substantive provisions. Most limitations go to form. A transfer of exclusive rights must be in writing and signed by the author, but nothing prevents the author from executing such an instrument to grant nearly all of her economic rights of exploitation. Thus, it is possible for a U.S. author quote, for good and valuable consideration, which could be the mere fact of disseminating the work, to assign, quote, all right, title, and interest in and to the work in all media, now known or later developed, for the full term of copyright, including any renewals and extensions thereof, for the full territory which shall be the universe, end quote. I am not making this up. The Raj Shast New Yorker ultimate car contract cartoon was not so far off in further specifying, quote, and even if one day they find a door in the universe that leads to a whole new non-universe place, or everything falls into a black hole, so nobody knows which end is up and we're all dead anyway, so who cares? will still own all those rights. <laughs> so stop whining, sign or don't sign, but face reality for once in your life because this is the way the world works, pal. <laughs> Worse, with one exception, this is a valid contract. The exception is not the extraterrestrial aspect. US authors can, it seems, validly grant rights for Mars. Although, under principles of territoriality, Martian law may apply to the substantive copyright matters the extraplanetary grant covers for that territory. The exception concerns the author's inalienable right to terminate grants of US rights 35 years after the grant was executed. Thus, even if the contract purports to grant rights in perpetuity and for a lump sum, the author can nonetheless retrieve most of her US rights 35 years after the conclusion of the contract. Accordingly, we next turn to the origin and vicissitudes of author's reversion rights. The challenge of fairly compensating authors is hardly new. The rise in the 17th and 18th centuries of a professional class of authors stimulated demands for better remuneration from their writings. The increase in authors who sought to live from their work 
rather than from patronage or personal fortune, likely provided at least one impulse for the author protective provisions of the first Copyright Act, the 1710 Statute of Anne. Under the regime of printing privileges that preceded the Statute of Anne, authors generally received from publisher booksellers a one-time payment made when the authors surrendered their manuscripts for publication. Authors whose works enjoyed particularly high demand might have negotiated additional payment for new editions or for new printings of the ne their next work, uh, of, for new printings of a work that had done well, or they might extract a higher price per sheet for their next work, but neither law nor custom generally assured authors remuneration which reflected the sales of their work. As a result, few authors benefited from the continued success of their work. Contemporary British authors lamented their exclusion from their work's subsequent profits. An item in the February 11, 1710 issue of the journal, The Observator, to which I owe Lionel, this actually comes from an article that Lionel and I wrote a while ago. Uh, the Observator recounted the argument of an advocate of a suggested amendment to the bill that would become the Statute of Anne. The amend amendment is designed as a kindness to us authors. Quote, that the booksellers seller shall have a property in the copy only for a limited time, after which it shall revert to the author or his assignees. This, they say, will be an encouragement to learning and a security to authors against being ill-treated or imposed upon by booksellers who run away with the profits of their labors. So that authors not being able to foresee this because copies are like ships put to sea, whose prosperous or unfortunate voyage is not to be foreseen. They have nothing more than their first copy money. Let the book sell ever so well. Parliament adopted the proposed author's reversion right in the last clause of the Statute of Anne. It states, provided always, that after the expiration of the said term of 14 years, the sole right of printing or disposing of copies shall return to the authors thereof if they are then living for another term of 14 years. Although the UK abandoned the author's reversion right in the 1956 revision of its copyright law, and U.S. case law before then had substantially, uh, U.K. case law before then had substantially undermined the reversion right by making it freely alienable. A version of the right has remained in U.S. law to the present in the author's inalienable right to terminate a grant of rights 35 years after its conclusion. In its current form, the U.S. termination right can provide significant benefits to those authors who successfully effect termination or whose prospects of termination prompt the grantee to propose a better deal before the termination period vests. But the right presents several shortcomings. First, it is of no avail to employees and to creators of certain commissioned works because the statute excludes termination of grants in works made for hire. Second, the effective date of termination occurs 35 to 40 years from the execution of the grant. The terms of the contract, no matter how leonine, will continue in effect for a long time, indeed potentially well past many works commercial viability and potentially well after the author has died. Third, the statute excludes from the scope of termination derivative works created by the grantee during the period of the grant. This is an immense carve out because it means that any ad adaptations such as sequels, motion picture versions, musical arrangements, or sound recordings made before termination and in accordance with the grant's terms can continue to be exploited under the terms of the now rescinded grant. 
Thus, for example, the author of a novel will not see a penny more for the post-termination exploitation of a television series based on the novel and created before termination. Happily, this carve-out does not extend to yet-to-be-created adaptations. For new post-termination seasons of that TV series, the producers will have to obtain new licenses from the author. Finally, termination is not automatic. The author must serve notice on each grantee within a minimum of two years before the effective date of termination of each grant. If she does not comply with the deadlines and other formalities of notice, all rights will remain with the grantee. Termination is better than nothing, but better still might be substantive limitations, not only on the duration of the grant, but also on the scope of the rights the author grants, for example, by reserving new media rights to the authors, as some national rights in the national laws in the EU have done, including the German law analyzed in Professor Cornish's 2002 Manges lecture. Another pro-author adjustment would require revision of the remuneration paid to authors should that prove highly disproportionate to the exploiter's return on the work. That is what the EU has required in its 2019 Digital Single Market Directive to which we now turn. Article 18 of the DSM Directive sets out the principle of appropriate and proportionate remuneration. It states that member states shall ensure that where authors and performers license or transfer their exclusive rights for the exploitation of their works or other subject matter, they are entitled to receive appropriate and proportionate remuneration. While the directive excludes authors of computer programs from the application of the principle, all other authors, including employee authors, appear to be covered. If authors are entitled to appropriate and proportionate remuneration, how will they know whether their contracts are producing disproportionate benefits for the grantees? Implementation of the principle of appropriate and proportionate remuneration requires transparency. DSM Directive Article 19 imposes a transparency obligation from which grantees may not contractually derogate. If the accountings reveal a sufficient disparity, Article 20 then entitles the author to an adjustment of the contractual remuneration. Moreover, the parties may not contract out of this right to readjustment. Article 21 establishes an unwaivable right to alternative dispute resolution, which may be a practical necessity for authors who cannot afford lawsuits to enforce their rights to contract review and revision. The DSM directive does not limit, limit the maximum term of an author's grant, but it does provide relief if the grantee fails to exploit the work. Under Article 22's right of revocation, member states may impose time limits on the exercise of the revocation and may allow the grantee time to begin or resume exploitation before the revocation takes effect. Member states may provide that the parties may not contract out of the revocation right unless they are covered by a collective bargaining agreement that already provides for similar rights. Articles 18 to 22's obligations are complex and too often ambiguous in their details, but they directly endeavor to lengthen the short end of the stick that too many contracts allocate to authors. Even in countries covered by the DSM directive, there remains an important potential impediment to authors' ability to reap the benefits of those laws. Many author contracts, especially in the digital environment, grant rights for multiple territories. The international dimension of these agreements may affect author protective contract law's practical impact 
even with respect to exploitations occurring within the enacting country's borders. Because general principles of private international law leave the parties to determine the law applicable to their contract, can the parties simply avoid domestic protections of authors' economic interests by choosing, or the stronger party imposing, the law of a less author interventionist jurisdiction to govern the full territorial extent of the transfer? The extent to which the stronger party may in fact elude national author protections depends on whether those measures are characterized as substantive copyright norms or as contract rules. If the copyright characterization prevails, the scope of the transfers will be governed by the laws of countries for which rights are granted, the principle of lex loci protectionis and at least some of those countries will include mandatory author protections. If, by contrast, the matter is considered one of contract law, then the scope of the grant will be governed by the lex contractus, the national law chosen by the parties or imposed by the stronger party. Thus, given the predicate issue of characterization it does not suffice for the grantee to choose the contract law of a state lacking the EU's author protections. To achieve the objective of contracting out of those protections, the grantee will also want to include a forum selection clause designating a national court whose rules of characterization will consider the scope of a grant to be a matter of contract law rather than substantive copyright law. For example, suppose the contract selects country A as the forum because that country's characterization rules would deem as matters of contract law such requirements as that the contract provide for an accounting of revenues, that's the DSM Directive Article 19, and an opportunity to terminate the grant in the event the grantee fails to exploit the work, DSM Article 22. Suppose further that country A's contract law imposes no limits on contracting out of these requirements, even though the directive provides for inalienability of those author prerogatives. The exploiter who will have succeeded in avoiding those obligations in all the territories covered by the contract, unless, unless those territories fight back by posing special mandatory rules as France has to neutralize this kind of circumvention. In general, one country's courts need not apply another country's mandatory rules. Even in the EU, the Rome Convention and the Rome 1 regulation permit but do not require applying foreign mandatory rules in a contract covering multiple territories. But France has taken a different, more aggressively author protection approach in the following circumstances. And I will not read the whole text. You have it there. Note that France seeks to ensure the benefits on French territory of its author protective laws, whatever the nationalities of the author or the grantee. France is not alone in what I'll call its territorial universalism. As interpreted by US courts, the US termination right allows all authors whose works are protected under US law to recover their rights with respect to exploitations in the US, whatever the law chosen to govern the contract and whatever the forum selected to hear disputes arising out of the contract. In both these cases, forum selection is really determinative. So if one can uh, devise means to avoid the 
circumvention of author protections through forum selection, uh, that may be a means to ensure that these protections actually are afforded. Now, admittedly, this approach curtails party autonomy when autonomy would undermine author protections. The observation may be true, but it also misses the point. The purpose of author protective laws is to override party autonomy. Content neutral choice of law rules create the problem in the first place. The rule of party autonomy, which directs courts to look to the law the parties choose for their contract and the forum they select for their disputes, enables the stronger party to avoid weaker party protections simply by submitting the contract to a less constraining national law or forum. In other words, when there is an imbalance in the power of the co-contractants, the rule of party autonomy is neutral only in appearance. In fact, it favors the stronger party. So far, we have seen that implementation of the principle of appropriate and proportionate remuneration for authors would require not only substantive legislation to counterbalance most authors' weaker bargaining position, but also private international law rules to counteract workarounds. But even if national laws adopted an interventionist approach, it probably would make little difference to the lar large class of creators who yet lack professional publishers and who rely on generally unremunerated internet dissemination to achieve the exposure that one day may lead to a contract that will provide payment, even if that payment proves disproportionately low. This brings us to the problem of platform terms of service. For exposure, or the hope of it, creators often turn to internet platforms, signing up for a Faustian exchange, the prospect of finding an audience, in return for the loss of control over the dissemination of their works. Moreover, the author protective mandatory remuneration rules of the DSM directive do not seem to apply to platform licenses. Recital 82 states, nothing in this directive should be interpreted as preventing holders of exclusive rights under union copyright law from authorizing the use of their works for free, including through non-exclusive free licenses for the benefit of any users. US courts, meanwhile, have upheld click wrap and browse wrap agreements, even where the platform reserves and then exercises the right to make unilateral changes to the terms of service. Oh, here's one example. We may revise these terms from time to time by posting a revised version. Your continued use of any of these sites and apps after we post such changes will constitute your acceptance of such changes. This means that authors may be giving up even more than they initially thought. It is also a far cry from the quaint meeting of the minds traditional concept of contract law, since it seems that the stronger mind may impose continual redefinition of the meeting place. Platform licenses are generally broad and despite significant variations in phrasing, may have little practical difference in terms of rights ceded by the author. To illustrate and compare the scope of rights surrendered, let's look at the terms of service of some of the principal platforms on which authors post their works, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. Uh, uh, I hope you can see the language, particularly that which is in red, I am not going to read it. You can read it for yourself. With respect to Instagram, this language means that the posting author grants to the platform an un 
compensated non-exclusive worldwide license to exercise all the rights under copyright and to allow third parties to do whatever the license permits the platform to do. Whether the platform in fact licenses third parties is another matter, as pending litigation in the U.S. has emphasized. The license terminates with the author's removal of her content from the platform or when she deletes her account. But as a practical matter, the licenses will produce effects long after that if third parties copy and redisseminate the previously licensed content. Now let's look at YouTube. The YouTube license adds to the Instagram terms of service an explicit authorization to use the author's work to promote the YouTube service. The Instagram license does not directly authorize third-party uses, although it allows Instagram to act as the intermediary between the author and Instagram's users, with Instagram empowered to decide the extent of any sub-licenses on a case-by-case -case basis. YouTube, by contrast, grants itself the same power while ex ante providing for third-party licenses for in-platform uses. If the author has no idea who the third-party user is or when or what the use will be, any meeting of the minds must be a legal fiction. Finally, Twitter. The Twitter license is the most far-reaching of those considered here, since it covers all rights under copyright including future uses, and authorizes third-party use, whether on or off the platform, all without compensation to the author, apart from the delights of using the service. The breadth and ambiguity of these licenses mean that authors may not receive the benefits of the Faustian bargain they thought they had concluded. When a creator authorizes the platform to use her content, she is ceding control over unanticipated exploitations. Worse, she may in effect be permitting the platform to usurp what limited opportunities for remuneration exist on the internet. That is because platforms with their vast repositories of royalty-free, from the authors, sub-licensable works may be the most efficient entity from which to acquire non-exclusive exploitation rights. The incorporation of works of authorship into artificial intelligence training data furnishes a timely example. This is a contentious topic, especially among photographers and graphic artists who fear that AI systems will learn from the training data how to generate images that will compete with those authors' present or future work. Some advocates have proposed that the data compilers enable artists and photographers to opt out of inclusion in training data. But if those authors have already made their work available on the internet, which they necessarily will have if the AI programs are obtaining the images through internet scraping, then based on our reading of the above licenses, many of those who post their works to internet platforms will already have authorized the works inclusion and recycling through training data and into user requested output, so there's nothing to opt out of anymore. In conclusion, to return to the challenge that Professor Cornish posed, how do we achieve real benefits from copyright laws for the authors in whose name the copyrights are granted? While Professor Cornish addressed substantive copyright law limitations on authors' contracts, must we now also look outside of copyright law to basic matters of contract formation? Should we question whether shrink wrap and browse wrap agreements should be binding in the first instance, 
or whether they should continue to bind if the platform, the stronger party, unilaterally changes the terms and conditions of the services it provides to authors. But even if we retreated from the extreme laissez-faireism that validates the current terms of service regimes in order to require real knowledge and assent, would authors in fact be any better off? Perhaps the hope of exposure makes surrendering copyright worth the candle, but that may be a short-term calculation that authors may come to regret. For those sought after real benefits, we may need to combat the bargaining imbalance in ways the EU DSM directive has not ventured for free distribution models. Professor Cornish spoke of authors sharing with publishers the risks and with proper adjustment, the rewards of a work's dis dissemination. Platforms, unlike traditional publishers, do not invest in the creation of works of authorship but they reap the fruits of others' risk-taking. One solution may be to allow and encourage creators to form collectives to bargain free of antitrust constraints with the platforms over the terms of service and to introduce methods of remuneration. That way, authors would remain risk sharers, but they might also have a better shot at becoming revenue sharers too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jane, for this really thought-provoking lecture. I would like to uh, invite now Professor Lionel Bentley from University of Cambridge to deliver his comments. Thank you, Martin. And thank you to Martin and Luke for the invitation and for the kind words earlier. Um, let me start by saying congratulating Jane on the choice of this essay uh, by Bill as the subject of her talk. Over the last uh, 16 or so months I've had uh, on a number of occasions to try and think about the qualities uh, of Bill's work and they are all very much epitomized in this particular essay. So if you haven't had an opportunity uh, to read it, I, I strongly recommend you do. Although it comes from 2002 and therefore might be thought to be somewhat, somewhat dated, it, um, it in fact represents uh, a huge number of the typical attributes of a great Cornish essay. It's steeped in history, it shows deep understanding of comparative law, it's focused on the French and German interventions in copyright contracts. It's funny, it's acute, it's humorous, it's wise. It's everything you really would like to see um, in a great essay. And then I'd like to congratulate uh, Luke and Martin on choosing Jane as the first inaugural lecturer. Uh, what better speaker could one have, think, have, have contemplated to give a lecture in honor of Bill. She worked with Bill for a long time in LIE and just after Bill retired, Jane was Goodhart Professor in Cambridge. But Jane shares lots of Bill's commitments, his commitment to fairness and justice uh, for authors um, and his uh, commitment to the importance of music uh, and the arts more generally in culture. So, um, Congratulations to Jane and congratulations uh, on having invited Jane. Like Jane and Bill, I'm very sympathetic uh, to the idea of intervening in uh, uh, authors' contracts um, and pretty much for the same reasons. We give authors different rights, we give authors diff different strengths of rights, different lengths of rights, etc. And the legitimacy of doing so depends on those rights positively benefiting the authors. Otherwise, we could just give publishers, sound recording uh, producers, etc., neighboring rights. We wouldn't have to give Life Plus 70, etc. So the goal is to find a way in which we can produce some sort of positive economic effect uh, for authors. 
And today's Jane's argument rightly focuses on deep challenges to these possibilities. This is a valiant attempt by the EU to improve the position of authors, though it must be said, of course, that most member states in the EU, apart from the UK and Ireland, already had a large number of pro-author contractual provisions in their laws. But there are real challenges to making these effective, and Jane highlights, his, highlights a number of those, in particular the private international law challenges uh, and also the challenges from uh, uh, free licenses. I'm not going to make any comments on that. I don't know anybody who knows more about private international law in this field than Jane. Uh, I've only once ever spoken publicly about private international law uh, 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 and copyright, and I had Jane by my side, so I knew that I was uh, not a long way off the mark, uh, and I haven't attempted to since, and I'm certainly not going to suggest anything she said uh, needs more nuance uh, than she gave it. So what I wanted to do was give a very brief UK addendum on what's been going on in the UK since the uh, Digital Single Market Directive. And as you know, uh, the starting point is that the UK uh, decided not to implement uh, the copyright in the Dig Digital Single Market Directive. It was uh, described by uh, Boris Johnson as the kind of nonsense uh, that we, the UK was precisely leaving the EU to avoid. But subsequently, at least in the context of music, there have been attempts to import a very similar regime for the benefit of composers and uh, musical performers. So following the DCMS Committee on the Economics of Streaming, it was recommended that the UK introduce an equitable right of remuneration for performers in relation to the making available of their works and also that the other mechanisms in the uh, EU directive also apply to composers and performers, with the addition in the place or the replacement of the reversion right on the basis of non-exploitation in the EU with a reversion right after 20 years. And these proposals were introduced uh, in a bill uh, led by Labour MP Kevin Brennan but unfortunately, and perhaps reflecting many of the things Jane said at the beginning of her lecture, the government uh, didn't support the bill. So it didn't even make a second reading. The government gave three reasons why uh, it didn't want uh, to go ahead with the bill at that stage. Firstly, it said there was a competition in markets investigation into the record industry that was ongoing. And secondly, that the IPO was looking into the impact of the EU laws on member states within the EU. E, within the EU. And thirdly, uh, it was optimistic that there might be some voluntary adjustments in relation to the position of composers and performers uh, taken by the industry itself. Well, the CMA reported at the end of last year, and it's quite clear the CMA is going to do nothing. It's not going to launch a market investigation. That is not to say, as I'll say in a moment, that the report is not interesting. It's a really fascinating document full of information about the situation of uh, music, musicians and performers in the record industry at present. The IPO, as far as I know, and I'm not, I must say I'm not in the loop, I haven't been in contact with the IPO, appears to have been doing nothing publicly anyway about this issue. It did issue a very interesting uh, report on uh, musicians and streaming, uh, led by uh, Leeds, the professor, uh, professor David Hesmenthal at the University of Leeds, who's a, a, an expert on, on, on the music industry. And this report is also full of fantastic information, just like the CMA report. And both of those I recommend as background reading to anybody who's interested in the situation in the music industry right now. What is interesting that those reports reveal is that there has been some voluntary movement by the record industry in relation to the position of composers and performers. In the first place, and I just will have to summon up the list of things, I'm afraid, uh, because I can't remember them. Uh, in the first place, the three major record companies, Universal, Warner, and Sony, have agreed to waive 
the deduction of advances and the need to or the, their right to recoup advances uh, from the award of royalties based on streaming. So they've voluntarily undertaken to provide the same suit or the entitled streaming remedies irrespective of whether advances have been recouped. Advances in recording contracts obviously have been very common. Interestingly as well, the Competition and Markets Authority identifies an increase in gross royalty rates from 19.7% in 2012 to 23.3% in 2021. Shorter contract terms, the minimum number of commitments falling from 3.8 to 3. Fewer contracts where the label takes ownership of the copyright in perpetuity from 66% to 26% and shorter average periods for the retention of recording rights by labels from 50.4 years to 30.0 years. And so interestingly, there seems to have been quite a lot of voluntary uh, movement within the record industry, favoring the positions, uh, the, the, uh, the rights of uh, composers and performers. That all leads me to think that the attempt by the government to uh, kick the issue of the Brennan Bill into the long grass is going to succeed and that we cannot expect any great intervention in the future. Uh, but as I say, I'm not in the loop on this either in terms of the record industry stopped speaking to me some time ago and um, the uh, legislature who I've just been uh, ignoring for a while. So let me finish then with, by referencing Jane's solution and bringing this thing uh, back round. Jane sees some possibility of overcoming the problems of, in particular, free license terms uh, and the situations that flow from re free license terms in terms of collective bargaining. And she rightly alluded earlier in her lecture to the importance of collective bargaining in the United States at present in the, in the Writers Guild dispute. Well, when Bill was discussing in his author, as Rich Scherer piece, the relative merits of France, French, French intervention, and the German intervention in the field of copyright contracts, he expressed a uh, preference uh, for the German. He thought the French concept was very individualistic and was unlikely to benefit many other, the, many other the few, was likely to be benefit few authors in practice whereas the German conception was built around collective agreements of standards. And he thought, thought that this approach to court copyright contract law had the benefits of allowing flexibility and nuance and adaptability to change while securing flaws for authors within appropriate industries. And I think Jane, in some ways, has found inspiration there for her solution to some of the problems that she's identified today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lionel. Uh, this was fantastic. So I'd like to open the floor now. Luke, can you help me with the second mic? For the questions. Jane, can I invite you to come uh, to the stage? Or maybe also with Lionel? If you, if you want, yeah, sure. Please. Thank you both for your wonderful presentations. Can you introduce yourself, sorry? Uh, my name is Lauren Bercy. I'm a PhD candidate here at LSE. Um, my question is, do you think the US will ever incorporate the concept of authors or artists' moral rights um, into the Copyright Act as prescribed in the Berne Convention? Um, California's attempt was declared unconstitutional, um, but there's an argument that it really ensures proper remuneration, um, especially for artists whose work um, vastly increases in value on the secondary market, which implicitly acknowledges um, that the original price may not have been proper. Um, okay, so are you, you asking about moral rights or, or law de suite, or both? Uh, both. Okay. Um, well. Let, let's uh, start with the law de suite. Um, the Copyright Office uh, has now done two studies. Uh, 
uh, back in the 90s, the Copyright Office expressed a lot of skepticism, but that was before the EU directive. Uh, the more recent Copyright Office study uh, is, uh, doesn't wholly endorse, but at least seems somewhat supportive of having an artist resale right. I can't say that it's on the top of anybody's agenda. The state of California had had a resale right, but as you alluded, it was uh, it was ruled unconstitutional because it was not sufficiently limited to California, and therefore was a burden on interstate commerce. Uh, the the resale right has been criticized by some as simply giving more money to the already rich, uh, but I think that that's not necessarily true. The resale, artist resale right gives up to 5% uh, of the uh, resale price at public auction. And uh, that's regardless of whether the work has increased in value or has actually lost money because, it, uh, because of the um, accounting fraud temptation of uh, limiting the Dwight de Suite to increases uh, only. Uh, and it turns out, at least in France, that there are a fair number of rank, rank and file painters who actually make some money off of the, the Dwight de Suite. So yes, the Picasso estates are going to make money, but uh, it's not just the, the, um, the or already uh, wealthy artists. So there's some equity in that uh, to the, the rationale for the Dwight Street was originally that most art, fine artists don't make money from multiples. Copyright is about multiples. And uh, so the, in the art world, it's really the physical original that has the value that, all, that the creator doesn't see any of because as a tangible object, the copyright is incorporeal the, uh, and uh, uh, the, the art object is, is, is a chattel, so there's no traditional copyright hook to get to the chattel, but uh, there, there can be spe special le legislation. Um, I think that it, it is possible, but I don't really see an immediate prospect for it uh, in, in the United States. Uh, also, visual artists now have more potentially more prospect of making some money um, because of the display right that uh, the, with the propagation of images on the internet if these could be successfully monetized by artists uh, there would be some money coming in from the incorporeal exploitation of, uh, of, of works of art. Uh, as for moral rights in, in general I, I don't see, we, as you know, we have a tiny, tiny moral right for works of visual art, but that's a very narrowly defined category. And the Copyright Office has uh, supported uh, attribution rights, and there may be a better prospect for uh, a law or for uh, judicial interpretation of the present law that would recognize uh, authors uh, claim to be recognized as the authors of uh, the works that they create. I think the prospects for the right of integrity uh, wielded by an artist who has surrendered derivative work rights is very small. If you keep the derivative work rights, uh, as famously Monty Python did in its scripts, uh, then you have a means of uh, controlling what your licensees do in, by way of changing your work. But if you have surrendered those rights, you, you really don't have any, any means unless there is some alternative source of law like the right of, right of integrity. But I think that that would be very um, controversial in the United States, not only with respect to the grantees of derivative work rights, but also for those who are concerned about uh, authors exercising censorship o over the uh, over changes to their their works. Excellent. Other questions? George. 
Hi, thanks so much. I'm uh, George Contreras from University of Utah, but uh, visiting here at LSC also. Um, and thanks so much for uh, for coming and for your your George. Talk. I don't think the mic is on. Can you try? It's not on. Oh. Because it won't be recorded. Then. Well, it's a green light. Is it okay? Can you speak a little bit closer? Is that is that better? Is it amplifying? Recording? Oh. None of the above. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll just project. <clears throat> um, so so you know. You, your comments uh, today, and and I think uh, most of the content when we discuss copyright and these issues centers on the creative uh, arts and uh, authors, artists, uh, choreographers, uh, playwrights, and, and and so forth. But we in these conversations often don't talk about uh, software, right? Which is of course a category of uh, copyrighted work that's pretty large and and pervasive. Um, and I, I noticed it was interesting in the French uh, statute that you put up on the screen, which I'm not familiar with uh, previously, it was about music, right? It's called out music specifically. Um, and in Vera, which, you know, the previous uh, question addressed, that's simply related to the visual arts. But, but our Copyright Act is a big tent, and, and software often creeps into um, and gets the benefit of um, provisions that were generally written uh, to benefit authors, musicians, composers, and so forth. And uh, one example of that is the, um, the termination provisions under 203 and 304 that you mentioned, um, where weirdly uh, uh, software authors uh, who uh, are not considered uh, or, or often independent contractors, uh, but um, even contractually, you know, uh, software is not one of the nine categories uh, that you can contractually make into a work made for hire. So there are like millions of uh, lines of code out there in the world that conceivably could be subject to termination, right? Um, that was undoubtedly unintended. And so I'm I'm wondering whether you think that in U.S. Uh, legislation, we should be more mindful of that and, and be more categorical in which types of copyrighted works we care about and which types of authors we, we care about, or, or whether, you know, you, you think that sort of technical uh, authors like software programmers um, should, you know, be looped in or lumped in with uh, creative uh, producers like artists, composers, and uh, performers. Well, the uh, the EU appears to agree with you because the EU excluded software uh, from the uh, the provisions of of Articles 18 to to 22. Uh, I I understand the the cons concern on two levels. One is uh, the concern that uh, things might come to a grinding halt uh, 35 years from. Uh, I'll address that ne next. And, and then the sort of more profound uh, uh, malaise with, uh, with, with software uh, as the subject matter of copyright in the first place, that, that software is, is, is different, that uh, what uh, Soft, what people who write software do is different because of its functional character. We made a mistake uh, in bringing software into copyright. I also think it's not particularly helpful to relitigate that. There's too much water under the bridge, not to mention a few international treaties to, to that effect. So uh, without getting into sort of the, um, the philosophy of authorship of software, uh, and whether it belongs in copyright, let me uh, turn to the more practical question, which is, is it really a problem uh, under the termination right? It is true that software is not listed in the nine categories of, of commission works that could be works for hire, and it is true that a lot of uh, people who write software are not uh, uh, employees, uh, to some extent, that's because the uh, the companies themselves have not wanted them to be employees for totally non-copyright reasons. Uh, but uh, software might nonetheless uh, uh, fit under compilation because uh, very few individual authors write an entire uh, 
program all by themselves. So, uh, a, it, and to the extent that a, a program uh, or a set of programs may, may be a compilation, that can be a work made for hire, no termination for work for hire. Uh, suppose, however, that there are, um, uh, not, that not everyone comes under that. Uh, is the prospect of termination 35 years later, how serious is that? Uh, how much code is hanging around 35 years later? Remember, the derivative works right, uh, a, uh, or the derivative works carve out would mean that even if one could yank the original code for purposes of writing new code post termination, all the code that is built on prior code uh, before termination can continue to be exploited. So, uh, not, and then of course there is the free, soft, free software world, which is it, it effectively uh, not terminable because it's how do you serve notice of termination on, on all the people who are uh, have taken licenses under the GPL. So uh, although I can understand some philosophical uh, queries about the inclusion of, uh, of software and, uh, and, and authors within copyright with all the rights that uh, that quote real authors uh, enjoy. I don't see it as a practical problem. I'm going to abuse the microphone if you don't mind, Jane, since I'm holding it and ask a quick question. So you mentioned collective bargaining as one potential way to bring this <coughs> to a conclusion. We don't see a lot of that at the EU level. In the United States, there's a lot more in the creative arts, a lot more uh, union activity. Um, on the subject of the Screenwriters Guild, it, it's very it's always been interesting to me that in, in the US where you don't have the moral right of attribution, instead of that, you have very strict rules at the collective bargaining level. And the Screenwriters Guild have extremely strict rules about who can be credited as the writer of, of an episode of a TV show. And, if you came to the writer's room with a story, you get a story by, but you might not be the official writer of the show because it might be taken away from you and given to somebody else. And then there's other people who come in, maybe do rewrites, but they're uncredited. And so they don't get attribution, but they do get paid. So they get remuneration. So I wondered if you had any thoughts about whether if collective bargaining is the future or should be the future, um, you might end up trading some rights to credit in, in order to get paid? Uh, well, perhaps I should um, develop what I, what I mean by collective bargaining. I don't necessarily mean unions. Uh, if it's a union, then you're an employee. And if you're an employee, you don't have the copyright. Uh, you might have the copyright in the, the first version of the script when you shopped it and it wasn't originally specially ordered or commissioned for an audiovisual work, but everything afterwards uh, is uh, effectively you're not the 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 author, uh, and therefore you don't have statutory rights, but you do have the power of the union, and therefore the collective bargaining. Uh, but what I was uh, thinking as well, and perhaps even more of, you have lots of in Europe, uh, not so much in the United States, which is the collective management. Uh, societies. We have, we have it for music, for non-dramatic music performing rights, so ASCAP and BMI. Uh, we have a, a little bit for uh, photocopy, now digital rights with the Copyright Clearance Center, um, and a little bit for artists uh, with Artist Rights Society. But we have very, very strong antitrust limitations on what those uh, collecting societies can do. And it may be that in order to promote a, a, um, a more level playing field in bargaining over remuneration from the, part of, from the point of view of the collective, uh, some flexibility will have to be uh, injected in, into the, the system so that the collecting societies can act with somewhat more freedom. And so that, in fact, we could have uh, collecting societies in more sectors than we currently do. 
Well, next question. Can you introduce yourself? Yes. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jane and, and Lionel, for this. Um, Alina Trapova at UCL. Um, my question is, um, so it kind of asks you to have a bit of fortune teller hat. Um, do you foresee that uh, in light of the CDSM directive and the exploitation contract provisions, do you foresee a situation where parties will seek to actually um, uh, circumvent these provisions by choosing a competent court or uh, an or and an applicable law where these provisions actually do not exist and maybe EU parties and do you do we actually or are we moving more to an international situation where um, we accept these contracts as being imbalanced and actually um, the bargaining power is imbalanced to start with so more akin to consumer contracts. Uh, well, I, I don't know that the studios uh, have have tried this gambit uh, uh, of uh, forum selection for purposes of, of uh, categorization and therefore to be able to contract out of mandatory provisions because we don't have mandatory provisions uh, ex except for the termination right. And it's uh, I think it's reasonably clear from case law under the previous Copyright Act uh, that uh, a U.S. court would uh, disregard an exclusive choice of forum clause that, uh, uh, that overrode the, um, the effectiveness of the termination right for U.S. exploitations. Right? But uh, if we get that French slide back, do you have the clicker? Mm -hmm. Uh, no, for, sorry. Yeah, this one. Okay, the, this is a direct response to the anticipation that uh, uh, that some grantees would uh, would make their contracts subject to exclusive litigation in the courts of England and Wales. That's really what we're talking about. Um, and I'm looking at the great expert on this issue. Uh, so, uh, the, in order to, uh, uh, and since because of Brexit, the, those mandatory uh, protections do not apply, and as Lionel indicated, uh, it's not, uh, not for tomorrow that they're about to apply in, in the UK or so, so it would, would seem. So, uh, in, in, in anticipation of that sort of uh, gambit, the the, the French law specifically says, notwithstanding any forum selection clause to the contrary. So uh, to the extent that your work is exploited in France, you get the benefit of the French implementation of the EU rules. If, however, uh, I've overstated that because it's actually quite limited to um, the uh, author of a musical composition that is incorporated in an audiovisual work. Uh, um, this, this shows that the uh, French parliament is not, um, not legislating from higher principle, but is legislating from a lot of lobbying on the part of the SASEM. Uh, but there has been the discussion about whether uh, there might be kind of a judicial extension of this, that even if this is uh, specifically for the benefit of film composers, whether the same uh, idea of, um, uh, of neutralizing the, the private international law gambit uh, might be applied by uh, French courts uh, on behalf of, uh, of authors of all other kinds of works. And there is precedent for this, as you may be familiar with the um, case back, way back in the early 90s involving the colorization uh, of an American movie called The uh, Asphalt Jungle. Um, John Huston was the director, uh, and the director and the screenwriter objected very strongly to the colorization of uh, their film, which they had intentionally filmed in black and white, uh, the colorization by uh, the Ted Turner Enterprises. They couldn't do anything about it in the United States because 
He was work for hire. The contract said any moral rights you have, you hereby waive for the US and every other jurisdiction in the world. Um, and notwithstanding that, the Houston heirs and the screenwriter um, went to France when the colorized version was going to be broadcast in France and said, moral rights, our right of integrity. The studio said, who are you? The, uh, you're not even the author, uh, at least not under American law, you're not the author uh, of this motion picture and only authors have moral rights. This is a US film, it's a US contract, all the points of attachments go to the US and the Cour de Cassation said, in France, we decide who's an author. And uh, in France, you know, authors have uh, inalienable moral rights, and therefore the, uh, the Houston heirs and the screenwriter can invoke that moral right against the broadcast of the colorized version of the film. So with that, that sort of concept of, of France decide who's an author and what rights uh, authors have for France, I think uh, could be brought to bear to extend uh, this, uh, this attempt to neutralize the circumvention of the um, author protective provisions. Okay, I think I have a quick question if I can also abuse before Julie. I, I give okay. you in a second. Um, I wanted to follow up on, uh, on, on one of the things that you said about your collective solution. So you seem to suggest that the, the, the CMOs are not necessarily what you kind of entirely had in mind, that sometimes there could be smaller uh, kind of collective uh, communities that would represent the interests that could negotiate. Is that, um, I, are you, I mean, one of the things that I've, I've seen is with the CMOs is that the CMOs for these purposes are not necessarily ideal institutions because they accommodate too heterogeneous interests. and. For some of these communities to find a, a sort of a, a low level agreement about certain uh, appropriate remuneration, you need to go to much smaller community to find a, uh, to find such an agreement. So it's part of a problem that we don't have those uh, institutions at place at the moment. We don't have collective uh, institutions for authors that would represent them on a, such a granular level. Um, or you think it can be accommodated within the existing CMOs, uh, that that's not necessarily the problem. Um, that's one question, and related to this is the obvious tension between protecting the author against, you know, free, is that there are communities that have personal preference, at least in some circumstances, to go for free. A example of GPL world and open source world and open content. So how do you navigate these two? Is the solution to that also through collective institutions or is it something else that, that you envisage there? Uh, well, I'm a little nervous about granular because the uh, what enables a, a CMO to level the playing field is uh, that is a, a critical mass uh, of, uh, of authors, of, uh, of right, right holders. So. Uh, now, does that mean that antitrust aside, we're not going to have enough authors who want to be paid? I kind of doubt that. Right? So yes, the, the free software world uh, is a counterexample, but as you indicated, um, the, the, I don't want to say, the word isn't ethics, the, um, uh, the gestalt of the free software world is a little bit particular. And I'm not sure that uh, concepts that, uh, that, that grow out of the, the GPL are necessarily transposable to, um, to authors who, um, who want to be paid for, for, for their work. Uh, so, uh, and I don't have, I have not worked through uh, how collective uh, management could could be brought to bear, but uh, I think that the there there is a need for uh, some kind of uh, uh, safety in numbers. You see it also in the generally not successful attempts to bring class actions on behalf of of authors. And uh, 
the in the Google Books case, for example, the class action was was not ultimately not approved by the court because the court found that there was not enough commonality of interest. Getting back to to, to your point, but there has to be uh, there, there has to be some point at which there is sufficient commonality of interest, notwithstanding that there will be divergences, that where there is, it's like a Venn diagram, where there is that core, that can be used as a, uh, as a bargaining unit. So, actually, now. We have two final comments, and then we'll invite you to join us for a glass of wine. So, Julie and Robin Jay. Hi, 